Good morning. And welcome this morning, Myerstown Church of the Brethren. I'm Pastor Dennis, and good to see you all this morning and hear the good fellowship that's taking place. Just several announcements before we come into our time of worship together. Uh, as far as prayer concerns, this week we're praying for those on page 55 in our church directory. The Cacalico uh, Church of the Brethren is the church that we're praying for, and the Wyomissing Church of the Brethren is praying for us. And of course, I call your attention to the prayer list that's in your bulletin. Just a reminder that that uh, Bible study is tomorrow evening, 7 o'clock on Zoom. The information to connect is in your bulletin. On February 1st, we'll be starting a new study in the book of Ephesians. So if you're interested, uh, let me know and uh, we can make sure that you get a book. And I'll, be, I'll get the books out. Um, I'll get the books that put the books out tomorrow for those of you that are in the Bible study. It'll be in your mailboxes. Um, I want to draw your attention to one thing in your bulletin. Back on the first Sunday of January, we kind of got caught flat-footed as far as how to get the information out that the church was canceled that morning. So now in your bulletin, there's a page with uh, says weather cancellation, and the information is there as uh, to the ways that we will notify you if we decide to cancel worship for any reason. Uh, radio stations, the church web page, uh, the email list, church email list, you can be on that list. If you'd like to be notified by phone, uh, information information there to give Joanne a call as well. So post that somewhere, put that somewhere safe so that you have that in case we need to look at it again. It's good to be together this morning and to worship our God. Let's come into an attitude of worship as Barb leads us.
Thank you, Barb. <clears throat> this morning, I have something for us to think about before we start the service. January is often a time of feeling down. Maybe you've already failed at many of your New Year's resolutions. You're spending a lot more time indoors. You're concerned about the new administration and whether you or your family is going to get COVID-19. But no matter what bring, is bringing you down, we as followers of Christ need joy. Now, I know I'm one of the older ones here, but how many of us remember the song we used to sing in Sunday school? Jesus, others, and you. What a wonderful way to spell joy. Jesus and others and you in the life of each girl and each boy. J is for Jesus, for he has first place. O is for others you meet face to face. Y is for you in whatever you do, put yourself third and spell joy. So why do we struggle with joy? It's because most of us su suffer from yoj. Yeah, you got it. You think of yourselves first, others second, and Jesus last of all. So how about let's spend some time with God in prayer, read your Bible faithfully, and study his word. Call someone, send a card to someone in a nursing home or a shut-in. You'll be surprised. You won't have much time to let dwell on your problems. So I challenge each one of you to switch those letters around this week and think joy. And now would we all rise for the call to worship? <clears throat> God inhabits our praise and hears our prayers. You are good and forgiving, big hearted toward all those who ask for help. We put ourselves in your hands with confidence and trust. We depend on you from morning to night. No one is like you, O God, and nothing compares to your greatness. Your love is immense. You are slow to anger and quick to show kindness. You never give up on us. Thank you for your infinite mercy. Now let us worship the Lord by singing our first hymn, Praise Him, Praise Him.
and please remain standing as you join with me in proclaiming the, our affirmation of faith. This is the good news which we have received, in which we stand, and by which we are saved, if we hold it fast. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, and that he appeared first to the women, then to Peter, and to the twelve, and then to the many faithful witnesses. We believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus Christ is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is our Lord and Savior and our God. Amen. You may be seated, and now Earl and Cindy and Barb will share their gift of music with us.
so much and that could be a prayer for all of us. <clears throat> the first scripture Pastor Dennis has asked me to read is Psalm 103, 6 to 14. The Lord works vindication and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. For he knows how we are made. He remembers that we are dust. And now uh, let's sing. Um, we'll gather, uh, stand, please rise, and we'll sing What a Friend We Have in Jesus.
may be seated. Please bow our heads as we come to a time in prayer. Father, we come to you this morning with thankfulness, thankfulness for your love and grace, because we know we are so unworthy of these. We thank you for the many, many ways you have blessed us, even during those times when we feel no joy in our lives. And I thank you, Father, that we can gather here to worship and bless those in leadership that provided for our safety. We ask this Holy Spirit to prompt us to help others, to think of those in need before ourselves. Help us to be understanding with what's going on around in this world and to accept the things that we should and help us to stand up for those things that you clearly tell us in your word that are not of your will. Remind us that you are in control and it's all a part of your plan. Bless those that are in need of healing, comfort those that are feeling lonely and those in pain and bring the peace to those with troubling concerns on their minds. Bring comfort to those that are facing unknown health issues. I pray for unity within this church and pray that this will come about because we are striving to serve you and to do your will. Be with Pastor Dennis as he brings his message and bless his words that we pray are from you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. And now, and now we'll have the... <laughs> I'm going to come down to you today, okay? You'll see why in just a little bit here. Good morning. Hi, Isaiah. Hi, Abby. How are you this morning? Good. I'm Carter and Kendallin. How are you guys this morning? Good. Good to see you. I have a question for you this morning. Do you know what it means to forgive someone? What does that mean, Abby? Like if you had a fight... You would forgive someone for what they would say? Okay. You could forgive somebody for what they say, that, that it's okay, that we're okay, that kind of thing, right? Yeah. I have a video I'd like you to watch this morning. It'll be up here on the screen, okay? A little bit of video about forgiveness. Why do we need to forgive? If there was a forgiveness in the world, God won't even forget. Forgiveness is like giving somebody a second chance. And God always wants us to give us second chances to other people. Because otherwise, if we didn't forgive, we might lose all our friends. Because we would just say, I'm not your friend. You're not my friend anymore because you did something wrong. You messed up my stuff. And then everybody would have no friends except imagine they were friends. So... That first one, the little boy said, um, why should we forgive? And he said, well, if we don't forgive other people, God won't forgive us. And the Bible does say that in, in Matthew, in Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. You can look it up sometime, but that's what it says, that if we don't forgive others, God won't forgive us. And the second, the, the young the, the girl said that um, forgiving someone is like giving somebody a second chance, right? Yeah. And a third chance, and a fourth chance, and a fifth chance. Um, in the Bible, Jesus said, when he was asked how often we should forgive other people, he said, okay, this is for you math geniuses now, okay? He said, forgive them 70 times 7 times. What's 70 times 7? Anybody know? I need a whiteboard. You need a whiteboard. <laughs> I'll give you a clue, 490. But he didn't mean you have to forgive somebody 490 times. What he meant was there's no limit on how many times we should forgive other people. And the little boy at the end said, well, if you didn't forgive other people, you might lose your friends. And I think that's some truth to that one too, okay? For, to forgive somebody is to say to them, you know what? You hurt me, but that's, we're okay. I forgive you for that, okay? And we're going to try to go on and still be friends or whatever, okay? And, you know, we forgive other people because Jesus forgives us. God forgives us in Jesus, okay? And when we do something wrong, God says, you know, because of Jesus, we're okay. 
we're okay with God, okay? And, and so when, when you have a time where maybe somebody hurts you, don't forget to forgive them. And if you forgive, if you, if you hurt somebody else, which we all do sometimes, okay, we say something or we do something that hurts somebody else, we can ask them to forgive us too, okay? And no matter what, you can go to God and you can go to Jesus and say, I'm sorry for what I did. Will you forgive me? And Jesus always says, absolutely, 100%, yes, you're forgiven. Let's say a prayer. God, we thank you for Jesus and that through him we are forgiven. You are a wonderful God and we thank you for that. Might these children always know that no matter what, you are there for them and whatever might be done or said is forgiven because of him, because of Jesus. Thank you and bless them we pray in your name. Amen. Thanks for coming up this morning. Okay. And now for the scripture this morning, I'll be reading from Mark 2, 1 through 12. When Jesus, when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. So many gathered around that there were no longer, there was no longer room for them, not even in the front of the door as he was speaking the word to them. Then some people came bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. And when they could not bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and after having dug through it, they let down the mat on which the paralytic lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this fellow speak in this way? It is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? At once Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were discussing these questions among themselves, and he said to them, Why do you raise such questions in your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Stand up and take your mat and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, Stand up, take your mat, and go to your home. As he stood up and immediately took the mat and went out before all of them, so that this was, so that they were all amazed and glorifying God, saying, "We have never seen anything like this." And now, Pastor Dennis will present this message. Let me start this morning with a question. And you don't have to raise hands or anything like that. Just think about this question. But has anyone here not done something that you regret? I would think that most all of us probably have hurt someone, hopefully not physically, but probably emotionally. We've said some things and done some things for which we felt we needed to ask for forgiveness or to apologize. Interestingly, I found that there are websites like one called Joe Apology, where you can post your apology online anonymously if you would like. Maybe you don't know how to reach the person. It's, it's, it's been a long time and you're feeling bad and your guilty conscience is getting to you, but you have no idea how to contact them. So you could go on this website and post your apology. Or you're not willing or ready to apologize in person, post it online and you'll feel better. Some of the postings on these websites are, are kind of humorous, but some of them reveal some much deeper issues. Let me give you two examples. Here's one from someone who is obviously feeling some guilty conscience, uh, guilty conscience over something that happened a long time. He says, Dear Minnie, I'm so sorry for the hurt I caused you nearly a dozen years ago. It was immature of me. I've since realized my folly. I think of you often, and it moves me to sadness that I hurt you. I'm so sorry. Hope you forgive me. And then here's one I think, well, maybe more of us should think about today. The, the young man by the name of Andrew says this. He says, to the people who I insulted on Twitter, 
I'm so sorry I created that Twitter page. It was immature and I could have hurt someone. There were many times I could have stopped myself, but I continued, even though I knew I was wrong. The feed has been deleted, as have all the tweets. So long as I live, I will never do anything as despicable as that again from Andrew. Well, I guess the positive side of these kinds of websites is that people have the opportunity to get something off their chest that has been bothering them. But neg a negative is that many of the postings I saw on these sites revealed relationships that had never been reconciled and guilt that after many years was still controlling people's lives. You know, most likely if we've done something for which we need to apologize, we have probably sinned. And there's a far better solution for sin than an apology on a website. You know, today in, in the secular culture in which we live, sin isn't a word that people use to describe their behaviors. Today people just make mistakes or have indiscretions but they don't sin. And mostly of that is because in the secular culture, everyone has their own standard of what is right and what is wrong. What is good and what is bad, what is moral and what is immoral is a, is a moving target. And the word sin has become an anachronism. Sin is only something that religious people talk about. Well, whether you call destructive behaviors, mistakes, indiscretions, or sin, semantics aside, the results are the same. People get hurt. Relationships get strained or destroyed. Feelings of guilt and, and shame control people's lives. Well, since we here gathered this morning are religious people, let's call our mistakes or indiscretions what scripture calls them, sin. From Genesis, where we find sin entering into the human experience, through Le Revelation, where the dilemma of human sin is dealt with and done away with forever, God deals with this problem of human sinfulness. You know, doctors study medicine not so much so they can go around telling people they're sick, but it's so they can heal those who are sick. But that healing can't start until their patients admit that they're sick. And sin can't be dealt with until we admit that we are sinners. God wants to relieve us of the burden of sin that we may be set free to order our lives according to God's plans and purposes for us. So what is sin? Well, Paul in his letters is really good at giving us lists of sins. Take, for example, Romans 1, where he includes things like unbelief, immoral sexual behaviors, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior and gossip, insolence, pride and boasting, breaking promises, refusing to show mercy to others. Paul is good at giving us lists. But I think more concisely stated... Sin is something that we say or something that we do that is contrary to God's standards revealed in Scripture. The first sin of humanity was disobedience. Don't eat the fruit of that tree, God said. But they did. And God's standard was given to Moses in the Ten Commandments, ten rules to live by. God's commandments are, are meant for direction, how to live life and experience life the way God intended for us. You look at those Ten Commandments, and the first four deal with our relationship with God, and the fifth through the tenth, our relationships with one another. Do you remember them? Exodus 20, 1 through 17. The first four our relationship with God. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a graven or a carved image. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And the remaining six are relationships with one another. Honor your father and your mother. 
You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor anything that is your neighbor's. Well, the New Testament reveals that behind all of these commandments is one basic principle. Love. Romans 13, 10, Paul says, Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And Jesus was once asked, which of the commandments was the greatest? And he answered this way, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. God's standard can be summed up in one word, love. Sin is anything that we do or say that is contrary to God's law of love. And anything we say or do, good, loving, positive things, or evil, sinful, hurtful things, everything has consequences. Good consequences or negative consequences. Anne Graham Lotz, Billy Graham's daughter, tells of a time when she was 17 years old and was involved in a car accident. She was speeding carelessly down a windy mountain road and smashed into her neighbor, Mrs. Pickering's car. She was too afraid to tell her father about the accident, so for the rest of the day, she kept avoiding him. When she finally came home, she tried to tiptoe around her dad, but there he was, standing in the kitchen. And Anne says, I paused for what seemed to be a very long moment frozen in time. Then I ran to him and threw my arms around his neck. I told him about my wreck, how I'd driven too fast and smashed into the neighbor's car. I told him it wasn't her fault, it was all mine. And as I wept on his shoulder, he said to me, Anne, I knew all along about your wreck. Mrs. Pickering came straight up the mountain and told me, and I was just waiting for you to come and tell me yourself. I love you, we can fix the car, and you're going to be a better driver because of this. Then Anne says, sooner or later, all of us are involved in some kind of wreck. It may be your own fault or someone else's. When the damage is your fault, there's a good chance you'll be confronted by the flashing blue lights of the morality police. But my father gave me a deeper understanding of what it means to experience the loving, forgiving embrace of my heavenly father. Through that experience, I think Anne learned some lessons about consequences. When you're careless, when you do something wrong, there are consequences. Someone might get hurt. You might hurt yourself. There's a good chance you'll be caught. When you try to hide what you've done, when you hold it inside, it's going to eat at you until you make an effort to in some way right the wrong. And when you're honest about what you've done, forgiveness offers the opportunity for restored relationships and also peace within yourself. I think one of life's hardest lessons is that sin has consequences, physical, emotional, spiritual, and relational consequences. In today's scripture, Mark says that Jesus was teaching at home, probably at Simon's and Andrew's home. The house was so crowded that that no one else could squeeze into the space, so a group of, of people dropped a paralyzed man through the roof right in front of Jesus. And Jesus' first words to the man were, your sins are forgiven. Jesus' words raised the eyebrows of some of the teachers of the law who were standing by watching all this. What is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus asked them, which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or stand up and walk so that they might know that the Son of Man, so that Jesus has the authority to forgive sins. Jesus told the paralyzed man to stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And he did. 
And it was common belief at that time in Jesus' ministry that, that illness and physical deformities and other health conditions were a punishment from God brought on by sin. And sometimes sin does affect our health. Addictions to drugs, to alcohol, or tobacco, even to food, can bring on various health conditions like cancer, heart conditions, diabetes. Hate, greed, bigotry, racism often lead to acts of violence. Michael Card, an author of a, a series of very short commentaries on the four Gospels, which I, I really like. But in his commentary on Mark, he says this. He says, there's a connection between sickness and sin, but not all sin leads to physical sickness, and not all sickness is the result of sin. Yet it is safe to say that all sin paralyzes. What Romans, that's what Paul says in Romans 7. She says the problem is that we become slaves to sin. We're paralyzed by sin. Sin is addictive. Sinful behaviors have a way of controlling our lives. Pornography is addictive. It controls and paralyzes and destroys relationships. All the lottery mania of the, of the past several weeks is, is addictive. It's a snare. As the prizes go up, so do the numbers of tickets purchased. 1 Timothy 6, 9, and 10, Paul says, Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. You see, the thing about temptation and sin is that it looks enticing and beneficial at the outset. But it pulls you in, and next thing you know, you become a slave to those behaviors, and you find yourself experiencing the consequences. I really do believe that it is true that the root of all sin is self-centeredness. It's all about what feels right for me. We become a slave to sin. Paul explains his experience with the addictive nature of sin in Romans 7. I've discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there's another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. But then he asks this question, who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? And his answer, I think you know his answer. Thank God. The answer is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Some of you might remember the days when we used typewriters instead of computers. And there was a little bottle of white liquid, usually within arm's reach, called whiteout. You can still buy it. But if you made a mistake, you raised the paper up a little bit, and then you dabbed some white out over the mistake. You blew on it a little bit, let it dry, and then you could type right over it as if the mistake had never been made. Nowadays, with computers, you, you just backspace or highlight your mistake, delete it, and it's gone. Wouldn't it be nice if we were self-correcting people? If you say something wrong, you just take the words back in and then say it differently. The trouble is, it's not that way. And whatever we say or whatever we do is out there. It's out there, and it can't be erased. Unfortunately, the human race isn't self-correcting. In fact, if anything, we're more likely self-destructing. But in his grace, God gave us one of his most amazing gifts, the gift of forgiveness. That's a lot more powerful than whiteout. God gave us Jesus. And at the cross, Jesus not only erased our sin, he paid the penalty for it and he removed it. In the words of the psalmist, as far as the east is from the west. And if you think about it, that's pretty far. God provided the way out of our mess. Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Ever since that incident in Eden, God has been on a search and rescue mission. 
I can understand why many would say that sometimes God seems like a God of vengeance and destruction. I mean, you look at the scriptures, Hebrew scriptures in particular, and we see God punishing his people for their sin and, re and rebellion. Forty years in the wilderness, exile to, to Babylon. But in all of that, God was keeping his end of the covenant he had made with those children of Israel. In all of that, God's ultimate purpose was the restoration of the relationship with his people. God does judge. God does have standards of holiness. But ultimately, God's desire is that no one will perish, that no one will be separated from him. Scripture testifies over and over again to God's mercy and love and his desire to forgive. Psalm 86, 4 and 5, You, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. Romans 5, 8, God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Our God is a God of second chances. We all make mistakes. We all sin. But God in his mercy and love offers us a way out through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and through faith in him. Forgiveness is God's answer to human frailty and sin. And the process of forgiveness begins with recognizing that we are sinners in need of saving and the realization that we can't save ourselves. God wants to relieve us of the burden that comes with sin, and he wants to set us back on the right path. It's all about God's mercy and grace revealed to us and made available to us in Jesus Christ. Extravagant loving grace is God's heart and character. It's something we might know in our minds, but it's also something we often struggle to accept in our hearts. Too often we fail to understand and experience God's grace, which is offered to us freely in Christ. We tend to continue to carry the burdens of guilt that God has already sought to remove through Christ. I think one of the hardest things is to accept God's forgiveness for ourselves. We don't think ourselves worthy. It comes down to a choice to continue to carry the burden of sin yourself or to allow the Lord to take it from you and set you free. You see, God has already done everything necessary for your forgiveness. One of the hardest things, um, all you have to do is accept it. Christ has done the work. He's already paid the penalty for your sin. So my prayer for you is that you live in God's grace. And as you confess your sins, that you may experience God's forgiveness in Christ. And don't think about your sin anymore. Easier said than done. Get rid of the guilt and simply trust his grace. There's one more thing that needs to be said about forgiveness. Because we have been forgiven in Christ, we are to forgive others. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Forgiving those who have offended us is not so much for the one who has offended us as it is for ourselves, the ones who have been offended. It is for release. Release from the bitterness, anger, hate, desire for revenge. Failure to forgive can easily lead us deeper into sinful actions ourselves. If you're carrying heavy burdens because of words or actions in your past, God knows them. Christ has already suffered for them. He longs to take you into his arms and say, let them go. Give them to me. If you're carrying bitterness anger, hate, a desire for revenge because of something someone has done to you. Forgive them, not just for their sake, but also for your own. Trust the truth that Jesus has already borne your sins on the cross. The work has been done. It is finished. T. 
King David is one of the heroes of the Bible, but he's also one of the greatest sinners in the Bible. And he wrote these words uh, in Psalm 103. Uh, Linda read them earlier, but hear them again. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. Would you join me in prayer? Oh God, how easy it is for us to see others in terms of black and white and to allow ourselves shades of gray. How quickly we judge others by what they fail to do and how quick we are to give excuses for our own actions. How readily we hold others to the rules and how quick we are to allow ourselves to bend the rules to justify our actions. We are so eager to hold everyone accountable to the letter of the law and to give ourselves a measure of grace. Lord God, when we take the time to truly examine our hearts, we find that we can relate to the words of Paul in so many ways. We don't do the things we want to, and the things we don't want to are exactly the things we do. We can feel trapped by temptation and sin. Yet the truth is that you have defeated sin. You have given us power over these struggles if we will only run to you. Help us to set our minds on you and to come to you whenever our desires try to persuade us away from living like your son. Thank you for your unending grace and mercy. In some moments of stillness, may the Lord hear our personal prayers of confession and fill us with the love of Christ that we might extend the gift of grace which has been so graciously given to us. Let's take a moment of silent prayer. have it you need it if you do have it you need more of it you withhold it but you shouldn't you fake it (laughs) might as well forget it to get it you have to give it you may think you don't need it now but you do Pretty soon, you'll be begging for it. Not that that's a requirement, because you can get it without asking for it, and you can give it without being asked. Sometimes that's the hardest thing you'll do. But when you do, it's worth it. Because we need to give it as much as we need it ourselves. After all, he gives it to us. Forgiveness, it's everything. Forgiveness is everything, he said. It is. Only trust him. Let's stand and sing together our closing hymn.
If you've never made that decision to trust Jesus, to experience that forgiveness, that freedom from slavery to sin, speak to me anytime and I'll walk that path with you and, and lead you to the one who forgives and forgets. Go in peace. Go in the knowledge of your forgiveness in Christ. Amen. Thank you.